This evening, um, oh. we're going to talk about Lamentations chapter four. And I promised that I would upload the this video for Facebook um, after we uh, did it in in church last uh, Wednesday night. So I wanted to fulfill that uh, promise and um, cover this fourth chapter of Lamentations in some detail. I'm going to begin by reading the whole thing. So really, um, as we talked about a little bit, um, each one of these chapters is approximately the same length, has the same number of verses, okay? There, it's made up of 22 verses, uh, with each verse making up three lines. And so these 22 verses made up of three lines, um, the first two, the first line of each verse started with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter four is the same way. Each line starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and then verse chap, uh, chapter three, also 22 verses made up of three lines, but each line in each verse was the same. So the first, the first verse, all three lines started with alpha. Um, the second verse, all three lines started with Beth and so on down through the whole, um, the whole Bible, right? Um, so chapter four is back to three lines with the only the first verse starting in um, on a letter of the alphabet. Only the first line of each verse. Okay, so let's read Lamentation chapter four. And on this first verse, you see how um, he comes out with this very first word, how, aha. Um, we talked about in the very first, um, the very first chapter, the very first um, uh, verse of the first chapter started with that, oh, how. And it's a question, and it's somewhat of a question, but it's more of an ex exclamation you know how is it possible how could this possibly be and so the aleph starts with aha um, how and chapter one began the first word of the first verse that way chapter two and again in here in chapter four how is the gold become dim how is the most fine gold changed the stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. Three lines. Verse two. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? The work of the hands of the potter. Even the sea monsters draw at the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people is become cruel like ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. They did eat delicately, are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embraced dung hills. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sins of Sodom that was overthrown as an monument, and no hands stayed on her. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. They that be slain with a sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, 
stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. The hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. They were meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord hath accomplished his fury, hath poured out his fierce anger, and hath kindled a fire in Zion, and it hath devoured the foundations thereof. The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. They have wandered as a blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart ye, depart, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, They shall no more sojourn there. The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled for our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heavens. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, is taken in their pits, of whom we said, Under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunk, and thou shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. So as we look at these, what I'm calling the vignettes of vengeance, in this poem, Jeremiah is giving these little snippets, these little scenarios, these little pictures um, that are to represent little vignettes, little flashes before his mind as he's reliving the destruction of Jerusalem, as he's rethinking about and re-experiencing, um, perhaps in his memory, perhaps in um, dreams and nightmares, he's having these flashbacks of what it was like Whenever, Jer- whenever Jerusalem was destroyed. And as we saw, I want to start off with this, um, these first 10 verses. You have this series of juxtapositions. Um, and the juxtaposition in this case is the ideal versus the actual, the um, ideal versus the real. And as we are going through um, sorrow, as we go through lament, as we go through mourning, as we experience the morning time, um, that's one of the struggles that we experience is comparing the new normal. And I use that um, phrase very loosely. Um, I I don't like the phrase, but comparing where we're at, what my reality is with what I expected my reality to be. And in that sense, the ideal. And so the first um, example, is just a picture of the temple itself. If you could picture in your mind the, the, the city on fire, the buildings burning, you have the, um, the soldiers running around um, looting, the looting, um, you have them literally taking the gold vessels out of the house of God, 
out of the temple and melting them down and carrying away this gold into Babylon. Now, who would have imagined, how is it possible that this gold that was dedicated for the house of God could be carried off to someone else? How has the gold become dim? How has the most fine gold changed? The change isn't in quality, but is it in purpose, right? Um, it's no longer part um, and holy as part of the of the temple of God. The stones of the sanctuary are poured in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion comparable to fine gold. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? And if you're looting, if you're going through um, a um, a very quickly through a store or through uh, an area and you're trying to find what is valuable, you're not going to, you know, capture on that on that pitcher or that plate or that bowl that that's um, made out of out of clay. Right. What is that? What happens to that in your struggle to gain the gold? You're you're just throwing away. You're you're knocking down. You're pushing aside. You're destroying all these earthenware pitchers. And in the same way, who the ones, the life that to Jeremiah is precious. He said, "How precious is life? The precious sons of Zion. What? Their life is cheap." Right? It's being destroyed. It's being killed left and right. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands? Um, in verse 3, now he gives um, a couple of vignettes from nature. He says, um, and we've learned, you know, we understand in science that even whales are mammals, right? They bear live young um, and they... Um, they give milk to their calves. Uh, so even like the blue whale or the sperm whale or any of these um, great sea monsters, he says here, even the sea monsters draw out the breast and they give suck to their young ones. Um, but then contrast that to an ostrich. An ostrich um, has no maternal care. Um, they will lay their eggs anywhere in the most vulnerable places to get crushed or broken or, or robbed. Um, and they have no way of confronting danger or any kind of courage or bravery, but rather they will go and bury their head in the sand if they feel threatened or, or frightened. And so he says, the daughter of my people is become cruel just like those ostriches, lacking all maternal instinct. And what is the result? The result is the children, the most vulnerable of the of the population, become uh, become prey. They're the ones that suffer the most. The, the tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. Right. Everyone's out for themselves now. Everyone is in survival mode and forget about the babies. The young children ask bread and no man breaketh to them. Um, the They that did feed, feed delicately are desolate in the streets. Those that um, used to be the top of the food chain, um, um, had other people wait on them hand and foot. Now they can't even find food for themselves, and they are they are absolutely in abject poverty. Um, they that were brought up in scarlet, and you can see again allusions to uh, to Job, and he was um, a rich man. 
he was well dressed um and then with the with the destruction um with the desolation of all of his riches then he was sitting on the dung hill and you have that same scenario being played out here in the city of Jerusalem For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment, and no hand stayed on her. So as he's thinking about these vignettes of, of destruction, something strikes him. He's like, you know, Sodom, the destruction that came to Sodom came in one day. There rained down fire and brimstone and burned everything up. And boom, everything was over as in a moment. But the destruction of Jerusalem dragged out and on and on for a long time. The daughter of my people were punished for their iniquities and the da and Sodom was also destroyed for its sin. But by comparison, the sin of Jerusalem is much more gruesome, or the destruction of Jerusalem was much more gruesome than that of Sodom. And it lasted out. And why is that? And he's asking this question, and um, possibly we will um, find some answer along the way. But part of it, I believe, is that... Um, Jerusalem had more to be responsible for. It had more um, responsibility because they had the truth of God before them. Notice how there are certain epithets that are used there in verse 3. Well, we looked at verse 2, the precious sons of Zion, the precious Sons of Zion. What a what a way to describe people. How um how do we value life? How is life valued? You know, for Jeremiah, um, there was a, a an enormous value on life. Notice um even as he considers their actions, even as he considers their um the what do you call it the the degeneration of their morals even as he considers the justice of their destruction yet he still sees he still identifies with them this is my people this is the daughter of my people and he repeats that line in verse 3, that he uses that epithet for Jerusalem, the daughter of my people. In verse 3, in verse 6, um, the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. And then again in verse 10, he says, the, the destruction of the daughter of my people. So he, even when he saw the destruction and understood the desert that that it was deserved still he maintained a value for the life and the 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 dignity and the image of god in in these people um for what they stand for and who they were even though they had debased themselves still he gave them a measure of respect and love and appreciation and value. Verse 7, her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was as a sapphire. So if we want to look at the, the, most, the most pristine um, religious fanatics of, of Israel, that was the Nazarites. They had taken a special vow. Um, if they fasted, it was for them to um, focus on God. 
if they ate a very limited diet. And this uh, actually, whenever I thought about the Nazarite um, diet, I thought about Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Now, after they had eaten the Nazarite diet for a while, rejecting um, wine, rejecting um, meat, only um, vegetables, they were healthier, they were fairer, they thought more clearly. Um, than ever all the other men around them. And that, that's the picture that you have here in verse 7 of the Nazarites. Um, you know, the ideal, the ideal Israelite is one who is dedicated to God, who, is, who has made vows to serve God. And the actuality in verse 8 is that their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the street. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. So while they should be this milk white, um, clean, uh, um, you know, fresh looking, clear complexion, uh, so on. Polish, you know, that that picture of, um, you know, a well-polished stone, a, a gemstone says the actuality is that um, they're not a diamond. They're still coal. They're still um, they still haven't received that transformation. And it's because of the hunger, it's because of the siege, it's because of the extreme oppression that has come on them through um, through the siege. And then, you know, by the by, he says, you know, to, to be killed in battle, to be killed by the sword is is actually a mercy compared to being pining away and being killed by hunger. They that be slain with a sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken, through for want of the fruits of the field. The hands, and then comes back to the women again. The hands of the pitiful women have sought in their own children. They have, they were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. They became so desperate as to eat their own children. And this is all summed up here um here in verse 11 the lord hath accomplished his fury think about the the extent of the god's wrath the purpose of the um of this destruction the trajectory of um, demolition. God brought it to full conclusion. He took it all the way out to that, that uttermost limit. He hath poured out his fierce anger, kindled a fire in Zion, and it hath devoured the foundations thereof. This is a picture of what God sees and how he thinks about the iniquities of Israel. Whenever God revealed himself to Moses at the beginning, he revealed himself in a burning bush. Whenever he, um, he came back and revealed himself to the entire nation of Israel, it was as fire descending upon the top of Mount Horeb. God wanted them to understand the, the fire of his love was a jealous fire. And as, um, as his love was pure, so it would be particular. He had chosen them above all the nations of the earth. And as they represented him, as, and as they were in relationship with him, they had no business being in relationship with anyone else. And he protected that relationship with 
jealousy. And it goes all the way to Hebrews chapter 10. Our God is a consuming fire. God is worthy of everything. And if we commit ourselves to him, we are committing everything to him. So we have this, um, you know, this paradox, as it were, between love and destruction, between um, passion, love and passion, right? And um, fire in its both purifying and its consuming. Now, the gold doesn't fear fire, right? It is purified. It is um, preserved. And it comes through on the other side still in its uh, with its original qualities but here god um has accomplished his fury in dealing with the iniquity of israel verse 12 the kings of the earth if if you could compare going back to when the temple was built right the golden age of Jerusalem, when David and Solomon had brought the extent of the kingdom of Israel to its fullest um, boundary, to its uh, furthest extent, the kings of the earth at that day would never have imagined that this nation, this empire, could have been reduced um, the way it is now. All the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. I mean, there is no way that you would even think about it while, as long as David and Solomon were alive. And yet here we are. And the, you know, the soldiers, the, the enemy is just rampaging. They're just looting everywhere. And then he comes and becomes very specific about um, the causes and the effect of the sin of of the sin. Verse thirteen: For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests and those that have shed blood of the just in the midst of her. There's three groups here of iniquities. One is the sin of lying. That's the sin of the prophets. The second one is the sin of um, of cheating or manipulating religion for their own purposes, for their own gain. And the third one is the um, is the breaking down of justice of the justice system which is the king's realm the 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 job of upholding the law is what should have been should have belonged to the king so the the prophets told lies the prophets um there were several times in which uh Jeremiah was given a job to go and talk to the prophets. The prophets before the destruction of Jerusalem said, oh, don't worry about the Babylonians. They're never going to get close to this city. And, you know, and Jeremiah said, actually, because of your sin, you will be destroyed. And then as soon as they had that first carrying away into captivity, the prophets, you know, wound up a new um, story and they said, well, don't worry. In two years, all of you will be back in Jerusalem. All the vessels of God's house will be back in Jerusalem. And so they continued this line, this false line of security. And um, Jeremiah would say, amen. I wish that were so, but God has told you and God has told me and we are aware this is not the case. We will be, um, we will be destroyed. 
we will be punished for our iniquity. They've wandered as blind men in the streets. They've polluted themselves with blood. Um, the injustices, the the lack of um, bringing justice to the widows, the ones who had lost their their husbands, their to the orphans, the ones that, who had lost their fathers, the ones who were killed um, as innocent, you know, and without cause, they are widows. Without cause, they are um, orphaned. And there's no justice given to them in regards the life of the of the man of the family in fact they were just the opposite the 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 priests whose job it was to look at and judge concerning leprosy now are in the same in the same category verse 14 and verse 15 they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart, depart, touch not. Which is the typical cry of a leper, right? Don't come near. And um, the, the priests and the prophets of Jerusalem did not say this in so many words. But they might as well have, because their spiritual sickness, their spiritual disease, their corruption was so bad, they might as well have been lepers running around saying, don't come any closer, don't come any nearer. The sin of the prophets and the priests and the king was un was 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 extensive and the anger of the lord hath divided them verse 16 says he will no more regard them they respected not the persons of the priests they favored not the elders um they lost their status before the lord the lord preserves institutions for a, a, a period of time you know, in in the interest of the institution, in the interest of society, um, even a church that is going uh, wayward may continue its status in the community for a little while. He'll give them room. He'll give them space to repent. A priest who has done good in the past and now is has um, committed evil or committed iniquity. He may be still given um, some respect in because of his office. And I think about um, King Saul. He was the king anointed by God, and David never laid a hand on his life. And he said, you know, the Lord is the one who set him up. And as that as such, even after um, he had grievously rebelled against the Lord, he was still he still had that office of the king and he was still the anointed of the Lord. And so David wouldn't touch his life. But now that that is only a temporary measure and the end of that has come. Because ultimately, when we stand before God, there will be no respect of persons, right? He's not going to respect your rank or your money or your social status or your um, religious status from a, from a um, community standpoint, from what other people see. But only he will judge righteous judgment. And he will judge according to what is true. And here in verse 17, 
is there no hope? Is there no hope? Verse 17 says, as for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. How many times did Jeremiah get his hopes up that maybe this nation will turn around? Maybe this nation will have a revival. Maybe this nation will seek God. Maybe these people, maybe this king will acknowledge God. Maybe this priest will listen and as he rereads the, the law that he will actually heed the word of the law. But time and time again, that hope was broken. And if we look to man, if we look to the institutions, if we look to the prophets, we look to the priests and we look to the kings, our hope is going to be dashed. As far as the priests go, verse 18, they hunt our steps. The priests who were Jeremiah's family they were his worst persecutors. They were the ones who, more than anyone, um, wanted to see him dead. They hunt our steps. They cannot. We cannot go in our streets. He had to sneak around just to save his life. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled. Our end has come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. He said, even when I went up into the mountains to pray, even when I desired, and, and there's that particular um, chapter there in, in Jeremiah, oh, that I um, had a, a place in the wilderness for wayfaring strangers. Oh, that my eyes were a fountain of water to pour out the tears for the daughter of my people. Even when I was out in the wilderness, they were tracking me down. They were following me. They were shadowing me. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. So that the ultimate hope, as our hope in the nation is gone, as our hope in the institutions is gone, the ultimate hope was in the anointed one. Here we have a picture of the gospel. Jeremiah wasn't looking for um, a nation. He wasn't looking for a political system. He wasn't looking for a person. If there is um, any hope, it is in the true prophet, priest, and king that is in uh, that God has set up. As we think about the ideal and what should be and the way things should happen, and then we compare it to the actual and where we find ourselves day in and day out with our inability to do right, with our inability to save ourselves, with our inability to heal ourselves, and our loss of hope, in ourselves, we should look away to the one that God has appointed as the prophet, priest, and king who will, who will assume that place. We should look away to the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. There was even a moment of this hopelessness for the disciples when they saw Jesus Christ hanged upon the cross when they saw the, the the wrath of God poured out on him in the form of the death of the cross he bore our stripes he carried uh, the burden of our guilt he bore our sin and in that moment of death there was this question is there no hope is there no hope? And we know, we know the answer. Yes. Because on the other side, he resurrected, he raised up. As we consider our lives, the Christian life, 
and we look at our failures and we look at our frailty and we look at our sin we look at um, the, our circumstances and the unideal circumstances in which we find ourselves. We can't bring about our own salvation. Our salvation is uh, not self-created. We don't have enough faith. We don't have enough perseverance. We don't have enough strength, but he has promised to ever be with us. He has promised to ever bring us. And through his death on the cross, he preached the resurrection in which Christ raised again from the dead and has again prepared a place for us in which we can go to be with him. We have a future to look forward to. We have a place. Um, those that were carried away into, into captivity, including Daniel and three Hebrew children, God gave them special re revelation that their, the captivity was going to last 70 years, but it was going to come to an end. The temple was going to be destroyed, but it was going to be rebuilt. In fact, Jesus himself said, you can destroy this temple, speaking about the temple of his body, and I will raise it up again in three days. The hope that we have is in the resurrection of Christ. And it's his resurrection that defines our hope. It's his resurrection that defines our life now. When we look at ourselves, failure, frailty, but he has given us new life in Christ. And we can live in light of the resurrection. And we have that resurrection life in us through his Holy Spirit. It's through the breath of his nostrils, the anointing of the Lord. There, verse 20, the breath of our nostrils, the anointing of the Lord. That's our hope. It may seem that um, the Holy Spirit was silent as the disciples gathered around and prayed for 10 days. It may appear that um, the heavens are silent, that our prayers are bouncing off the top of the ceiling. But never fear, the Spirit is coming. The Spirit indwells us as a church, in order to accomplish the work that he has called us to do. The last two verses don't give any reprieve from the gloom here. It's a, a it's an, simply a continuation. He has this facetious little thing. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. In fact, we know over in Obadiah that that's exactly what Edom was doing. Edom had a hand in helping with the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah says, you're laughing today, but just you wait. The cup also shall pass through unto you. Inasmuch as you didn't take a stand today, inasmuch as you sided with the oppressors today, it's also going to come to you you will be struck as if drunken, and you will make yourself naked. You will be stripped of everything. You will lose your cognizance. You will lose your orientation. You will lose your sense of equity, your sense of balance. Verse 22, the punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. It's finished. Not in ourselves but in Christ. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. That's not going to happen again. That was, that was accomplished, fulfilled, done for. Now it's time to rebuild. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will discover thy sins. 
Jerusalem, brethren, our sins are accomplished through the death of Jesus Christ. And it is only through his death and his resurrection that we can live even today. I'm not saying that everything's going to be ideal in this present world, but the idealism is restored through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the good news. That's the message that we have to give. And through that, may each of you be blessed.